two slides for Sama. So I also very mentioned regarding Sama's things. Very good, very and good. also Mandiraji told a bit more uh, during good. the sessions. So I think it is internationally circulated because it is actually ICTP and IITM, both the organizers. So it is jointly organized. So very hopefully, good. hopefully something will be good. And some yeah. students showed their interest to be live members. I, I could see that. People have registered from IIT until yesterday also people from IIT have registered. Okay, that's great. So <laughs> at least we are, we are able to do that, at least something. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, actually they are also interested. Uh, Milind Mojumdar sir, sir and now, Sir, I yeah. think now uh, live streaming is uh, started. Okay, okay, fine, fine, yes, fine. Sir. Thank you. Great, great. Great to see you, Dr. Jagbandhu. Panda. Hello, hello. How are you? Fine, fine. How are you? I'm good, good, good. So, now only one thing started. Dr. Ranjit Kumar has been started. One of your magic committee members. He is still missing. But anyway, we should start now. It's already 3 o'clock. Yeah, live streaming has been already started, sir. Live streaming started, okay. So, let's start for today's Satellite Meteorology Weekly Online Lecture Series. Today is the fifth lecture. And it is related to remote sensing of clouds using multi-sensor observation by Dr. Bipasa Paul Sukla, ma'am. So before going to the main presentation, I would like to invite uh, Professor Dr. Somesh Das, sir, Town Secretary of SAMA, uh, for the welcome address. Sir, stage is okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Sagata. I'm audible clearly, right? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. Very good. So. Uh, ABM Dr. Ajit Tagi Saab, President of SAMA, uh, Dr. Bhatia Saab, uh, the Chairman of the Advisory Panel Committee of the Lecture Series, uh, today's distinguished speaker, Dr. Dipa Saab Paul Sukla from Space Application Center, Ahmedabad. ISRO is now in good demand. Uh, everybody is looking for ISRO because of the Chandrayaan mission and uh, other one, the solar <laughs> mission. <laughs> Yes, everybody is thinking that they must learn satellite meteorology because uh, this is the era of satellites and uh, all that mission. And especially the topic on which you are going to talk, the clouds, you know, a highly short subject. Uh, people would like to learn about the clouds and how the remote sensing of the clouds are done, especially uh, to, to diagnose the properties of the clouds remote sensing by remote sensing techniques. So your talk is going to be very interesting. Our other uh, organizing committee members, of course, uh, Dr. Swagata, Dr. Jagbandhu, Dr. Mohan Kumar, Dr. Mili Ghosh, uh, distinguished uh, uh, participants. Uh, we welcome you on behalf of the South Asian Meteorological Association and uh, the Vinala Institute of Science and Technology, Mitra. Um, well, as I said earlier, the number of registrations are increasing even now. And as of today, the total number of registrations is 1,792 till about 12 o'clock when I checked it. And people from about 60 countries have registered for this course. The popularity of these lecture series I have mentioned also is increasing because you know, I could see that about 2,277 people have viewed the, you know, the inaugural lecture uh, given by Dr. Kelkar Saab and Dr. Rajkumar Kumar Sarma Saab on the first day. And similarly, the last lecture, which was given by Dr. Atul Kumar Verma, has already been viewed by 452 people. So this uh, number is going to increase day by day. So as there are many newly registered participants and also the speaker uh, is attending for the first time, I would like to repeat uh, some of the things which I said already in the last lectures. Uh, this is the fifth lecture of the 20 lecture series on satellite meteorology, as you all know. And this is the continuation of uh, our efforts on capacity building of the people of this region. Many of you, May already know that we conducted the first online lecture series on atmospheric physics uh, that was jointly with the SRM Institute of Science and Technology Chennai for four months during January to April 2023, in which we had about uh, 2,000 people registered from 48 countries. And we conducted the 
second online training series on WRF modeling system. And that was jointly conducted by the CDAC, which is the Center for Development of Advanced Computing in India. Uh, that was conducted for three weeks you now with hands on practicals. And the people from the South Asian countries, our member countries of SAMA, could also do hands on practicals by remotely logging into the high performance computer of CDAC. So, this uh, is our third attempt of the capacity building on satellite meteorology. As you know, we have a distinguished panel of very senior scientists and professors from reputed institutions of this region who are experts in the fields. The syllabus of the lecture series has been designed based on the feedback and requirements of the member countries of SAMA. This lecture series is targeted to postgraduate students, although I know that you know, there are many students uh, who are still studying in their BSc in meteorology or BSc in physics probably also. They have registered for this course. But nevertheless, uh, you know, these are meant for the capacity building of all those people who are interested in uh, learning the subject. Also for the non methodological background. For example, many people have backgrounds of physics or mathematics or statistics, but yet they are interested or they are already working on the subjects related to meteorology. So it's also meant for them. And as you know, this lecture series uh, is for five months, that is 20 weeks, and started on 2nd of uh, September and will continue till 28th of January 2024. Uh, we have provision of giving certificates uh, for those who will attend at least 75% of the lectures. And, uh, and for others who still may be interested you know, to get some kind of a grade certificates, uh, like whether they could uh, get the outstanding grades or excellent or very good, etc. For them, we will conduct a small test at the end of the lecture series in which they will have to appear and then score accordingly uh, by which we can give them the score certificate also. As you know, the lecture series is also live streamed on the YouTube channel of SAMA. The lectures will also be available afterwards on the YouTube for those who could not attend the course you know, uh, live because uh, of the time difference between India and other countries, as you know, because people have registered from countries as far as you know, West in South Africa. Even there are some people from registered from the USA. You can see from the list of registrations, and as far east as Philippines and you know, those in you know, Korea, etc. So there is a wide range of time zone, and therefore some people may have a difficulty in attending the lecture live, and therefore for them, the lectures are available on the YouTube. They can. Now go back and listen to any of the lectures, especially that will be useful for them when they are attempting the written test, which will be conducted at the end. So we shall try to have more interaction between the speakers and the participants in this lecture series. Please write your questions in the chat box. Uh, our moderators will pick up the questions at the end of the lecture, and they will be answered by the speaker. So enjoy the lecture and have a good time. Over to you, Dr. Sagata. Thank you, sir. I don't know the voice is okay right now or not. Still very low. Uh, I mean, to me, it is still low. Yeah, very low. so after this, I'll just change it. I don't know what is happening today. It is the same system, but uh, okay, thanks a lot for that welcoming address. Now, I'd like to invite our president of SAMA, uh, ABM Professor Dr. Ajit Tagi, sir. Sir, please give your, uh, share your vision uh, for this. Uh, online lecture series. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, are you, you are mute. Am I audible now? Yes, yes. Yes, yes, sir. yes sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Swagata. And uh, I join uh, Professor Swameshwar Das in welcoming all our participants and special thanks to Patia Saab, Chairman of the uh, Program Committee and the Management Committee members who are organizing this particular lecture series in a most effective and efficient manner. Uh, we had uh, uh, this series started with the inaugural lectures by Dr. Kelkar and Rajkumar Sharmaji as brought out, it has been viewed widely that they provided an overview of uh, 
satellites in meteorology and space, followed by fundamentals of, of uh, remote sensing. By, and then the last lecture was on microwave uh, remote sensing. And today uh, we have a very important lecture on, on the clouds. Well, uh, clouds are in fact uh, most fascinating and uh, one of the uh, I think the best gift nature is given to the humankind and uh, clouds are part of each culture, uh, popular uh, mythology, uh, folklore, uh, music, and uh, we, we see them in different shapes, sizes, and they manifest themselves in the rain, which is so, so uh, linked with our prosperity. And if you look our uh, see ancient uh, lecture uh, by, by eminent people and also our mythology and the religious books starting from Vedic literature to the Ramayana, in fact, in uh, uh, Ramayana written by Varmaki in Kishinda Khan, uh, is a detailed description of the rain process is given by Lord Rama to uh, Lakshman. So, so, and thereafter Varamari and Kautilya, everybody had been uh, linking uh, the clouds, the rainfall and weather uh, as a part of the uh, our social system. Now, coming to the present age when we started to see this observation of clouds, uh, these used to be a synoptic observations at different locations and it was very difficult to have a totally integrated view of the of the uh, weather processes which are taking place, the weather systems. And the satellites have really revolutionized this particular aspect. Uh, now we have uh, both in space and time continuity of the observing of the clouds. Clouds, as we know, are manifestation of various atmospheric processes you know, and the meteorological parameters, the temperature, humidity, vertical motion. And uh, Clouds, they, 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 they work from the mesoscale to the synoptic scale to the climate systems. So uh, they are on varied scales and I am happy that today we are going to have a glimpse of this uh, based on the visible infrared and the microwave. So you see the Tyros 1, the first picture which came was a photo camera, uh, very, only in the visible and once in a 24 hours or 36 hours, you used to get one picture in a limited area. Now we have a see, holistic view from the geoset stationary satellites. Every five to 15 minutes, we can scan the clouds. And so even in the now casting, uh, the uh, satellite pictures are being used or satellite images are being used. And of course, it is not a scale to this. Um, we are extensively using uh, their inputs in the models. And I'm happy that Vipasha is going to deliver. She is working on using the mathematical models and techniques to use these satellite-based cloud information in now casting and also retrieval of the uh, microphysical parameters, very important aspects as far as satellite observations are concerned. And also she is uh, very much in the uh, ISRO's outreach program uh, with the UNCSSTP, RESPON and the SMART program. So this is also one of the outreach programs which we are doing through SAMA. So we have a very hands-on speaker in this field, Vipasa. So thank you so much, Vipasa. We look forward. And um, I'm sure uh, the participants will uh, be interacting with you. And also we request you to respond to their queries even after the lecture uh, through the email if they approach you ideas to uh, bring uh, the speakers to the doorsteps of, of all our participants and uh, well uh, we, we are down in the north the monsoon is withdrawing but south the monsoon is still active and as Petruska was saying the Kerala is, uh, so, uh, Sri Lanka is having good rain so enjoy the rains monsoon vagaries each year monsoon is different and this year too we had different uh, uh, they drop somewhere the, the floods any elsewhere. So this is the what challenge meteorologists have to uh, to see, pop up uh, in forecasting and observing. 
and hopefully the satellite uh, will continue to uh, help us in, in understanding and forecasting uh, weather and rain uh, in a much better way. Thank you so much, Prabhasa, the management uh, committee for organizing this lecture and uh, the series of lectures, in fact, and they have been planned so well by Akhya Saab and our uh, scientific committee. Thank you. Enjoy your lectures. Make best use of it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Whether you are not audible at all. Then someone has to do right now, I think. Uh, now you are audible. Now you are audible. I, now, I, now I am audible? Yeah. Very feeble, but okay. Uh, okay, then, then someone has to maybe take care of it I, before getting the solution. Uh, can I continue or someone? Dr. Swagata, you are not really audible. Please uh, check your mic or otherwise maybe you have to be loud <laughs> really. Out, but I think mic is not working properly. It's okay. In that case, uh, Dr. Divya Prakash can uh, moderate the session. Or Dr. Mohan Kumar, he is traveling in the car. I see that he is just, just one Yeah, I think it's all right, sir. Uh, now it is time for uh, introducing our... Now, I, uh, uh, now is it a... I think, Satushka, are you ready? Uh, uh, yes, I am ready. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Is yeah. Okay? Shagodadi. Yeah. Shagodadi, please. Is it okay? Yeah. yeah. Yes, I think uh, so. Satishka can introduce our today's research person. Okay. So, please, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you, Mohan. Uh, let me introduce our distinguished guest, Dr. Bifasha for Sukla. She received her PhD in applied mathematics for her research on the transport phenomena in fluids. She's working as a scientist at the Atmospheric Sciences Division. Her research interests include development of mathematical models and techniques for satellite image based with now casting and cloud microphysical parameter retrieval. Her main uh, focus area is on the application of space time for social benefit, particularly for hydrometric disasters like heavy rain, thunderstorm, cloud bus, etc. Um, she is the recipient of two ISRO team excellence award for her contribution in satellite weather applications. She is the SAC focal point of several projects under the umbrella of ISRO outreach program. She is also registered as a PhD guide for mathematics at the Gujarat University and has more than 60 publications in peer-reviewed journals and conference proceedings. And uh, floor is over to you, madam. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'll uh, start sharing my screen. Yes, madam. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, now it, we are, would like to welcome you to share, present your presentation. Thank Please. you. Mm. Dibbo, yeah, I think if Shogatas... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir, I can, I can take care, sir. I can. Sure. I will take care. Um, everyone can see my screen. Is my screen visible now? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. It is visible. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Sama, for giving me this opportunity. You can to... put in the presentation mode. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Is it okay now, sir? Good, good, very good. Yeah, yeah. it's good. Okay. So, uh, the topic of today's presentation is remote sensing of clouds using multi sensor observations. And uh, as we all know, as uh, Taggy sir also uh, said that uh, we know clouds for a for a different multitude of reasons, like uh, poetry and uh, beautiful um, shapes of cloud which we see every day. So uh, those are uh, the beautiful aspects of cloud. With that, as a meteorologist, clouds we know are very important and uh, they are the modulators of Earth's climate. And uh, knowledge of the cloud properties and their variations in space and time, basically they are essential elements for understanding the global climate change. So in this lecture, we are going to see how with the help of space-based uh, observations, with the help of remote sensing observations, we are able to uh, study the cl clouds, basically identify the clouds, 
see what kind of uh, cloud characterizations can be possible through the diff different remote sensing techniques. So, and these clouds, as we know, are very, very useful for our uh, water budget studies. They play a very crucial role in the hydrological uh, cycle, different cloud process studies, and also, spe especially the cloud properties in the micro scale. They help us analyze the cloud aerosol interaction, which is also becoming very crucial these days. So establishing data sets for climate and weather forecast validation and model parameterization development, for all these aspects, we do need uh, uh, objective characterization of the different cloud properties. So uh, we start this slide with a very uh, uh, unknown picture which classifies the clouds in different uh, vertical layers. So we have different types of clouds. And uh, basically, the lowest level of clouds, those are the uh, low clouds, cumulus cloud, then stratocumulus cloud. And uh, in the mid layer, we have the altocumulus cloud, where it uh, the cloud varies from, the height of the cloud varies from 2 kilometers to 7 kilometers, and high level clouds such as Zero stratus, zero cumulus, and cirrus cloud. And uh, with these clouds, we also have the clouds which have um, a vertical growth, the clouds with vertical development, such as the cumulonimbus cloud, which is being showed. And this is of major interest to us because these clouds govern the rain pattern, these clouds govern the extreme events. So we are much interested uh, about studying these clouds and if whether we'll see how is it possible to study these kind of very different kinds of clouds with the help of satellites, which are actually located at so much distance apart from the Earth. So uh, just to get a perspective, we like to talk about the scales. Uh, what, how does a cloud um, vary in scale? So we, we can see that we have the synoptic scale and uh, then we have the cloud which uh, uh, which has a lower scale and uh, then uh, we are going actually from macro to micro scale then uh, entrainment mixing particle tracks and microphysical aspect so clouds are present basically in all those scales and how we are studying how we are targeting to study the clouds in all these scales will define the different applications we are intending to do our studies on so uh, the microphysical aspect, so it may seem very strange that uh, through remote sensing measures um, or remote sensing observations, can we really categorize the microphysical processes taking place inside the cloud from such a great distance, doing uh, having no physical contact with the clouds, taking only the radiance measurements and trying to derive meaningful information about the microphysical characterizations of the cloud. So as we can see in the um, in, in this figure down that uh, we, we uh, the cloud have very small droplets um, smaller than the clouds we have aerosols or the attican particles or the cloud con condensation nuclei uh, whose particle size is one micron and after that uh, less than one micron then the cloud droplets varying from the typical size varying from two to ten microns then drizzle uh, drizzle drop and raindrop so this is the particle size and we will see how this type of particle size becomes very important in all our analysis okay in order to see further about the microphysical characterization of cloud or the cloud properties we need to understand the radiation budget of the earth uh, I'm sure uh, my previous speakers have uh, go, gone in detail about um, the radiation budget and how it is varying throughout the atmosphere. Uh, I am only going to stress on the cloud part of it. So we have the incoming solar radiations, which are getting absorbed by the cloud, then reflected by the cloud. Again, some of the outgoing radiations, the terrestrial radiations, those radiations are also getting absorbed and emitted by the clouds. So basically, this is the entire gamut or the play of the radiation, which is uh, taking place in the Earth atmosphere system. And finally, we have something called the outgoing radiation. 
so it might be reflected solar radiation as well as the um, your emitted radiation in the long wave radiation so this is the outgoing radiation is the part which a satellite is basically measuring and uh, because of the inner uh, constituent uh, or the constituent characterization of the clouds or the microphysics of the cloud or the cloud height these radiation which is being emitted scattered reflected and observed and uh, getting observed by the uh, satellite is different for different types of cloud and uh, for uh, clouds having um, different constituents so we will see how these are getting different so uh, these are the basic components of the radiative transfer so this entire play of uh, the radiation budget um, if we try to uh, categorize it and try to study it with the help of equation that com comes under the purview of radiative transfer um, calculations so the processes responsible for change in radiation so as a radiation passes through a cloud or it gets scattered from a cloud basically three things are getting done one is extinction second is scattering into and third is emission so extinction is also composed of two major components absorption and scattering out so we see here that there are two scattering components one is the radiation which is being scattered into the medium in this case that is the cloud and next is uh, the component of the extinction that is scattering out which is uh, the cloud particles when they encounter any um, radi radiation it is scattering out the radiation away from the medium so entire thing can be represented in form of um, partial differential equations as we can see it here so i'm not getting into the mathematics part of it this is just to get a idea get a feel about what kind of calculations are being getting involved into this radiative transfer process so uh, the interaction of the radiation with the clouds it um, this forms the basis of the remote sensing of clouds in this case we find here that there is a incident uh, light and this you can uh, the sphere you can consider as a cloud um, or this irregular shape also you can consider as a cloud so we find here that uh, that the rays a and d they are getting scattered the ray e that is getting absorbed and together the scattering and the absorption they comprise of the extinction so extinction basically defines of whatever radiation is not getting into the system so um, uh, how the radiation is becoming less the incident light is becoming less so scattered light gives the cloud white appearance scattered out that that will give the um, cloud a white appearance and scattered into an absorption so intensity of the direct beam progressively reduces inside the cloud so cloud is basically causing a decrease in the incident light through scattering into an absorption basically called extinction so these are the processes now if we try to form the basic radiative transfer equation what we will see uh, we have the solar irradiance so uh, i like to stress here that uh, at this level i am only talking about the optical remote sensing of course we will see the electromagnetic uh, entire spectral range we will see that but at this moment i am just talking about the optical um, remote sensing so we have uh, solar irradiance here so that gets radiated inside this medium which we can assume as the atmosphere inside somewhere there is a cloud also so we have three components like extinction scattering and emission so extinction it is um, consisting of the absorbing and the scattering into and scattering out basically in all directions so in different directions it is also governed by different kind of phase functions and emission so when a, um, a body or a medium is getting warm the molecules are getting warm uh, after absorbing the radiation at some point of time it starts emitting the radiation so we know that from our basic physics that uh, a body when acquires a particular temperature it starts emitting 
the radiation. So that is emission point. So, um, so these are basically all these simple uh, equations. These are basically being governed by the basic physics which we had uh, learned uh, in high school. Uh, the Planck's radiation law, Wien's displacement law, and Stiefel Boltzmann's law, and this short child's equation and Beard's law. These basically govern the absorbing portion of the medium. So these are basic theories. So all all these equations which we are taking are basically we are taking from these kind of theories so if anyone likes to uh, read about them so uh, in order to read about radiative transfer it is a wise idea to get into all these laws just brush them up and then we can understand those things better now about extinction we already saw that uh, extinction and emission may, basically those were being governed by the previous laws which were uh, shown and uh, basically uh, your Stephen Boltzmann's law that how, how much radiation would be emitted. But scattering is a little bit different phenomena. So there are basically two parts of scattering. Um, here we have certain hypothesis of what is the size of the particles which are uh, the scatterers uh, or which are part of the scattering medium. So if uh, scattering is not a very uniform aspect that for all wavelength and for all size uh, similar scattering will occur it is not so so scattering is basically a function of two things first is wavelength second is your particle size so uh, you can see from this is a very important graph and uh, uh, you can uh, see this from this graph that uh, when we start from visible near infrared thermal ir to microwave so a particle which may be scattering uh, as a Rayleigh in a particular wavelength might become a my scatterer in a in a microwave domain so this kind of differential uh, differential scattering with as a function of wavelength so this is a very crucial part and this complicates the thing so basically, this is one of the very challenging aspects which we need to consider when we are forming a, a radiative transfer equation. So we cannot categorize that if it is a, a cloud, it will uh, be a uh, Rayleigh scattering or it will be a my scattering. It may be a my scattering in the optical region. It can become a Rayleigh scatterer in a microwave region. It also can have neg neg negligible scattering. So these kinds of things we should keep in view. Uh, so two things to notice here that scattering phenomena uh, is responsible on the particle size. It is also responsible on the wavelength. So for different wavelength and for different particle size, uh, we have different scattering mechanisms. So now uh, we have uh, basically... Uh, uh, we, we saw basically and we came to know about different remote sensing um, terms. We, we did not uh, get into very deeply about all the terms, but now we are in a position to basically visualize in a way how a satellite is measuring a cloud or the cloud properties. So as you can see, um, radiation is coming from the sun and in the visible, it is getting scattered and can be taken in by the satellite uv also so remote sensing by reflection visible by emission it can if it is through emission it can be in ir and microwave domain in scattering it can be visible uv and microwave with that we also have active sensors so till now what we talked about was sun was the source when sun was the source and uh, our particle or a um, body is getting uh, the radiation from the sun and basically storing the energy getting uh, emitted so here this is this type of remote sensing as you might be knowing is called the uh, passive remote sensing with that we also have the radars and the lidars so they throw a beam at the target and the reflected radiation there uh, these sensors try to a map the intensity of the reflected radiation to the char character or to the characterization of the uh, target which they are trying to span. 
so now uh, at this level we know that uh, in in order to carry out these kind of analysis or to have some meaningful conclusion about the cloud its type uh, the uh, cloud characterizations or the microphysical aspects we need to have different kind of observation so this is a, a snapshot of the global observing system so we have polar orbiting satellite the geostationary satellite so for meteorological um, observations or meteorological uh, uh, applications the use of geostationary satellite is very important because uh, the geostationary satellite as the name suggests is stationary with respect to the earth so it is basically looking at a point of the earth uh, with high temporal resolution so uh, with the inset series of satellite we have currently we are having inset 3d and 3d r uh, satellite so both of them are looking at the surface of the earth and the atmosphere and the clouds with a repetition of 15 minutes so we are getting every 15 minutes we are getting a snapshot of uh, the earth atmosphere system so with inset 3d there are other global satellite systems also available and um, i am looking at the entire gamut of the global available satellite systems uh, there may be um, polar orbiting there may be inclined orbiting and for mostly the met, met applications we are having inset 3d and um, uh, we also have himavari we have meteosat we have goes so these basically look at different part of the globe with a high temporal resolution so continuously these geostationary satellite they pick up a region on the globe and they continue looking at that particular region um, with a higher temporal resolution now there are different sensors for meteorological applications uh, there are active sensors as i discussed it was a radar so different kinds of radars are possible uh, like uh, there is a synthetic aperture radar the doppler weather radar the scatterometer also is a radar altimeter also is a radar then lidar is also available so all these uh, uh, types of active sensors these are available then with that there are different passive sensors as i am going to discuss the image of the sounders the spectrometer the spectroradiometer so a uh, little bit difference of, uh, in between the sensors are there so passive sensors basically uh, take the radiation um, which are um, which are available to them from scattering absorption extinction and emission and they uh, try to um, derive certain uh, functional relationship between that radius and a cloud property so uh, to discuss we have uh, at present we are having india's advanced weather satellite that is the inset 3d and 3d r so it basically carries four payloads uh, there is a six channel multispectral imager so this particular sensor that is a six channel multi spectral imager is one of the most useful uh, instrument when we are talking about clouds over our south asian region so uh, with that we also have a 19 channel sounder um, so the, uh, in this the sounding is usually done in cloud free region so along with that there is a data relay transponder and a search and rescue transponder so the retrieval of the geophysical parameters from inset 3d and 3d r are operational at imd and also at MOSDAT, and there are so many geophysical parameters that are routinely retrieved. Just to give an uh, idea about uh, this kind of spectral channels with which we are actually seeing the Earth atmosphere system, uh, I am mainly concentrating on the imager. So we have a 16, uh, 6 channel imager. So uh, these are the, these wavelengths are the spectral bands or the spectral region uh, through which we are seeing our earth atmosphere system so this is the visible band the first one is a visible band then this is the short wave infrared band then there is the middle infrared the water vapor channel and we have two thermal infrared bands so as we saw that uh, different uh, mechanisms are present for 
uh, the radiations which we are observing through these spectral bands. So that is why it is good to observe in different spectral bands. So in order to have diverse information about our target. To summarize, uh, what actually we are seeing, uh, we have the six channel imager. So I'm only taking inside 3D. So if we are going to take Meteosat, the similar kind of uh, images are visible also from GOES over their area, uh, their region of interest. So over India uh, and surrounding regions, we can see that uh, we have visible sphere, uh, middle infrared, water vapor, TIR1 and TIR2. Just uh, to make a, a very simple analogy, we can see that these visible is about um, your reflection, reflection from the cloud or scattering from the cloud. Sphere, we will see what uh, purpose it is serving. Similarly, so um, uh, your thermal infrared will give you the temperature of a body. So the higher the cloud, the lower will be the temperature. So that is the information a thermal infrared channel is giving. So just to show it by a simple uh, visualization, suppose we are seeing this kind of a cloud uh, from our satellite and uh, with time say t1 t2 t3 that cloud is basically going up in the atmosphere so it is going up in the troposphere and there we can see an anvil formation here so basically your temperature is reducing so the ir channel is basically uh, observing lesser radiance which when uh, converted to the brightness temperature will give you a lesser brightness temperature. So this is uh, the brightness temperature. So um, uh, this is somewhat similar but not exactly uh, similar uh, same as the physical temperature because uh, we are not exactly measuring the temperature. We are trying to estimate it and this, this is basically conversion of the radiance into an effective temperature which we call as the brightness temperature. So Planck's inversion is being used in order to calculate um, this temperature from the radiance. So we can see that uh, inside the cold core of a cloud, it ha is, has a low temperature as compared to the peripheral uh, boundary of the cloud, which is having a higher temperature. So this means the center portion of the cloud is at a higher, uh, is at a greater height than the periphery so it is the cold portion of the cloud so this is the information which we are deriving from an ir uh, sensor um, uh, channel so uh, similarly this is a visible channel uh, picture and we can see very beautifully this is uh, this is a, um, a thunderstorm uh, uh, rather a, a multicellular system and we can find multiple cells of a thunderstorm and uh, you can see here how uh, radiation is being scattered through the top of these clouds and this is being observed in a uh, from a visible channel so uh, basically visible channel is scattering your uh, radiation in the visible uh, your clouds are basically scattering the visible radiations and uh, your uh, TIR in the thermal infrared, when we are measuring, we are getting the height of the cloud or the temperature of the cloud. Now, suppose we want to know in the, um, we want to know the difference or we want to know the spectra. Just, uh, this is a simulation of the spectral um, difference between a water cloud and an ice cloud um, in all the, in the, uh, completely the visible and the uh, short wave infrared region. So visible is from uh, your uh, 0.5 UV, then visible 0.5 to your 1.6 to your 2.2 microns. So we are covering the short wave infrared region also. Why I am showing this particular spectra? So this is very important to note that uh, what, uh, the water and the ice cloud uh, what difference it is having so it is the uh, difference it is having is about the constituent so water cloud is having maximum 
uh, water droplets while our ice cloud is having ice crystals. So even if we are not considering the crystal nature or the um, shape of the crystals, even if we are uh, neglecting those, we still have something like the refractive index of both these mediums. So where does uh, you find, uh, where, uh, where do you find the most variation or uh, where both these curves are diverging from each other? So uh, we can see at this region and at this particular region. So at all the other regions, you find the blue uh, curve or the blue line, which is the water cloud, is more than that of the ice cloud. And only in this particular region, in this particular region, in this particular region, is your water um, reflectance less than that of the ice. So what is happening in this particular region? So if we note it down in, in, in terms of inside, this is the 1.6 micron channel. So firstly, we looked into the thermal infrared channel where we saw that it was um, it, it was signifying the cloud height or the cloud temperature, cloud top temperature. Second, we looked into a, a visible uh, image of uh, a cloud where we found that it was basically the uh, scattering effect of the cloud, uh, cloud particles. And here we, we can also see in the visible, the scattering effect of the water cloud is more than that of the uh, ice and finally here what we are observing is the situation is re is reversed in the sphere sphere channel that is a short wave infrared channel now uh, why i am saying hyperspectral uh, in earlier slides what we were seeing was multispectral only six channel now if you want to si simulate the entire spectra there is a continuous spectra which we are trying to simulate. So that will come under the purview of hyperspectral observations. At present, we do not have any hyperspectral uh, sensor at the geostationary platform. Uh, in future, we might be having that. So uh, for our simulations, we can use some models to simulate the hyperspectral uh, spectra or we can use air campaign. So recently, over India, there was an air campaign which was known as the Everest NG. So I'm using these observations. So these are the different channels. And you can see the cloud. Uh, so we have more channel number of channels. Also, although it was a hyperspectral instrument, I'm just showing a few, but more in number than the multispectral channels. So what we find here, we are finding suddenly uh, this is uh, the um, uh, we find that these are not at all getting showed the clouds at 1.8 micron the top level clouds are not at all getting shown similarly so when we look at this image it gives us a reality check that uh, the same cloud but we are observing in different bands so it is seeming as if we are looking at different clouds it is not at all seeming that we are looking at the same cloud only and we are getting a different picture altogether. To discuss further about the spectral signature of water and ice and why is it so different and because of that we are getting uh, uh, some kind of uh, different result in the sphere channel, we need to look into the refractive index of water and ice. So, uh, uh, what do we have here? We have this, uh, the first graph is a refractive index of water and uh, the red dotted line is a refractive index of ice. So the imaginary part of the refractive index of any medium is related to the absorption. So what do we find here? We find ice is higher than that of water. The imaginary part of refractive index is high in case of ice rather than water this means absorption in case of this particular channel 1.6 micron channel is higher in case of ice than water so a cloud which is containing more ice will appear as darker 
in the 1.6 micron or the switch n. So the same cloud will appear very bright in visible, but it will appear darker in a or it will have less radiance in, in the sphere channel. In case of water cloud, what is going to happen? Uh, in the visible also, it will appear bright. And in the sphere channel also, it is appearing bright. So that is one way to demarcate between a water and an ice cloud using a combination of sphere and visible channels. Again, your uh, size, the particle size also is different. Uh, it, it also plays a very important role uh, as your uh, particle size increases, your albedo or your reflectors gets decreased. So in a nutshell, uh, what we know that smaller water droplets will appear bright in um, your uh, 1.6 micron channel. And bigger ice particles will appear darker or will have less radiance in your 1.6 micron channel. So uh, just to sum this up, so if you are observing water and ice uh, using the different channels, uh, visible and sphere, we find here that uh, this is ice cloud and this is water clouds. This particular is water clouds. And uh, you can uh, see here that ice clouds are appearing darker in the sphere channel. So that is an, a subjective way of looking into the ice and the water clouds using sphere and uh, visible radiance, only a very subjective way. But from these uh, particular channels, we will be able to derive our cloud effective radius and the cloud optical thickness. So cloud effective radius, if we want to understand in a layman's way, it is a measure of the cloud particle size. And the cloud optical thickness, it defines the opacity of the cloud in a way it is dependent on the number of absorbers or the scatterers you encounter within the medium. So both these two properties, the cloud optical depth or the thickness and the cloud effective radius uh, distribution, they describe almost completely the radiative properties of a cloud. So these are the two microphysical parameters. If we consider, we can define or characterize the entire cloud um, radiative properties. So this is just a representation of how uh, tau is the optical thickness, how for two different optical thickness your reflectance will va vary with wavelength and how uh, your uh, effective radius, how, how your reflectance will vary in uh, different wavelengths. Similarly, um, in order to calculate objectively, if we consider the information content, then information content for a cloud effective radius and optical thickness is not only con um, contained in the multispectral bands, which we are using like 1.6 and 0.5, but is contained in the entire spectra. You can see this is the information content is given the y axis and in x axis, the wavelength is there. So we can see that, okay, in the uh, 1.6 micron or 1600 nanometer channel, the information content is high. But if we are going for hyperspectral measurements, of course, information content is there in between, um, in between the multispectral bands as well. And uh, so this gives us a clue that uh, although we all are looking like uh, deriving information using multispectral bands, if we have the hyperspectral measurements of different cloud types, we do have something like a fingerprinting of the cloud. We have a very specific signature of different clouds which we can get. So this is a simulation. This is um, a simulation study where we get different spectra for different kinds of cloud. So if we can build a hyperspectral library of different kinds of cloud and we have measurements just like um, not exactly as a mineral mapping we would be able to derive exact conditions for a cloud using a hyperspectral measurement um, just to have in a table what kind of atmospheric parameters or cloud parameters we can have from different uh, spectra or from different spectral channels. 
so already discussed so in order to sum up we can say that different cloud characteristics using different channel so visible channel is for cloud opacity and thickness swift channel is for cloud particle size the thermodynamic phase and uh, thermal infrared channel is for the cloud top height now we have three different channels and uh, those attribute different properties so we, uh, this actually gave the concept of having an rgb or a, a red green and blue image a composite image of a cloud where we can discriminate so uh, operational forecasters sometimes use this method to discriminate between different cloud types using an rgb image and uh, this i have taken from uh, uh, the goes our interpretation and uh, here uh, our entire suit of rgb interpretation and the guide to it is also given which basically from an rgb image tries to identify different types of cloud so mixed phase cloud water cloud ice clouds so um, having all that underlying information in our hand we can well relate to this that rgb means r is for visible so visible if it is a red obviously uh, it's a, a ice cloud your visible uh, will be very bright low green because it observes ice clouds observe uh, absorb in um, your sphere channel so it will be low green so larger ice particles and low blue also because it is very cold so serious kind of a cloud will appear as this structure this particular color so these kind of interpretations are possible this is uh, one uh, module provided uh, by uh, professor rosenfeld you might said that what is the feature indicated by this uh, red arrows where uh, we can see that uh, through this rgb interpretation we can well find out that this represents a mid level super cool water cloud this green structure here in between because uh, this green um, indicates that high reflection in the sphere channel so it is most likely a water cloud it won't be a ice cloud so we can exclude the high level cirrus cloud and the cloud also does not have a strong blue component so it is relatively cold so it will be uh, mostly a water cloud so uh, it is a mid level super cool water cloud so these kind of rgb interpretations also can be carried out as a part of the curriculum so in order to understand get a more feel better idea into the remote sensing images which we see now having understood uh, those entire um, the theory behind it there are lot of products available which actually give us an idea about the structure within the cloud the microphysical aspect or although we are having um, other macro physical aspects of the cloud such as cloud top temperature cloud top pressure micro physical um, um, aspects are complicated and complex to derive but we uh, with the presence of 1.6 micron channel we are able to derive the inset 3d 3d r cloud effective particle effective radius and this is now available every 15 minutes so uh, the rain bands can be seen as bigger size particles so these kind of um, uh, inferences can be drawn or a lot of data mining approaches also can be used in order to derive meaningful information from these products as uh, earlier i was telling that uh, we had a everest and ng campaign for a hyperspectral so eventually we need to go uh, in order to have a fingerprinting of different uh, cloud types uh, on cloud characterization we do need to have a hyperspectral instrument someday in future so uh, for that different air campaigns were done and we found that uh, we were able to derive very precisely the uh, cloud classification the microphysical parameters and this kind of a 3d map of the cloud at present at this, uh, this particular place could be drawn out another application now we are getting into the app part of the clouds through remote sensors all these applications till now what whatever we have done uh, we have shown now uh, does not include any in-situ data just plain uh, satellite data but with that if we include the in-situ the ground-based measurements also 
um, or our model measurements also, then of course we can have a more synergistically more advanced application clubbed with the satellite application. So again, the cloud microphysical uh, param parameters during a thunderstorm, how the organization is taking place during a thunderstorm. So widespread increase in the pi uh, size of the particles and the density. And in mature phase, so homogeneity in the bigger cloud particles leading to precipitation. So all these kind of things we can see and uh, do with the uh, remote sensing of cloud parameters that is uh, available now. Another very important thing um, which we all are now looking into is the dust intrusion or the aerosol intrusion within a cloud. So uh, without the proper microphysical characterization of the cloud, we cannot know how an aerosol is impacting a cloud. So uh, the dust intrusion into a thunderstorm, which can uh, trigger a lightning. So these kind of studies also is possible uh, with the help of only using the remote sensing of cloud. Also, there have been studies which link uh, the cloud microphysical parameters to the Indian uh, monsoon active and break spell. Although it is a uh, the study is at a very nascent stage, but uh, still uh, promising linkages between the two have been observed, and it is up to the future researchers to carry uh, this kind of a study forward. So, with the optical sensors, the radar applications for uh, cloud remote sensing are also possible and uh, using CloudSat and GPM DPR data. So CloudSat is a, a cloud radar and uh, so basically it gives the profile of the cloud structure and your global precipitation mission, a uh, uh, dual precipitation radar is there, the GPM DPR which measures or observes uh, in KU and Ka band. So it gives the vertical profile of rain. So uh, we can uh, club both of these uh, instruments, the observations from both of these instruments along with the optical sen sensors to have a very synergistic application part. So uh, this is, I think, uh, in a very heavy rain, particularly a cloudburst kind of an event, what kind of inferences we can draw that what is uh, the profile of the supercooled liquid particle, what is uh, where the liquid particles are present, what is the height, and then relating that to the vertical profile of the rain. So uh, um, rain particle size distribution. So we can look into these studies. So to summarize, we can say that uh, remote sensing of clouds, we, um, uh, it's an interesting but a very challenging domain. And uh, so the study of the different radiative transfer in different spectral channels, they reveal actually different cloud characteristics and the different phenomena which affect the radiation interaction with the cloud are scattering absorption emission all those um, parameters or all those processes are there also multispectral and then slowly moving towards hyperspectral imaging so that should be the order of the day and we should include more and more measurements to get different uh, to span uh, or sample out different cloud characteristics and uh, microphysical investigation through uh, spectral analysis. So we are getting uh, higher and higher into the spectral resolution in order to resolve the microphysical characterization. So this is how we are mapping our uh, remote sensing with the cloud characterization. So these are some um, references. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, with that, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know now it sounded okay or not. Yeah, it is perfect, sir. Okay, so that yeah, 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 correct. Okay, <laughs> so thanks a lot, ma'am, uh, for that uh, nice presentation. Uh, we are we are going for that uh, question answer session, but before that, usually we do the photo session. So I request all the panelists please switch on their camera. Uh, Chatushka, ma'am, is not there anymore. We need to take the chair's picture. Yeah. So, and today, okay, our photographer is also absent. 
So uh, let's I take that picture. Uh, Dr. Ranjit Kumar, please uh, switch on your camera. Dr. Ranjit Kumar, are you there? Okay, nice. So shall we proceed? Because I don't think uh, Chetushka Mam is nearby. Because the last few minutes, I noticed that. I noticed that chair, Miss chair. Yeah. Uh, okay, I can be, I give a call directly if she comes quickly. So in the uh, meantime, can we go for question answer session, maybe? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good idea. You, you can, you can proceed. So do you allow people to talk or? Uh, no, you you just read out the questions. You are you know, merely memory read out the questions on behalf of them. Because uh, I don't see. Okay, one question oh. I got. Uh, one guy is asking, are we able to measure the exact height of clouds from satellite imagery? Uh, yes, uh, we are actually able to measure the height of the cloud uh, through the thermal infrared um, measurements because thermal infrared is basically giving the temperature. That temperature can be converted into the cloud height. So we are basically measuring the cloud top height. Of course, the base of the cloud height, we are not getting through optical measurements, but uh, we are uh, through the radar, we will be able to measure the cloud base height as well. Okay. So next question is, what forces can influence scattering rather than particle sizes? What? What forces can influence scattering okay. rather than particle okay. sizes? Okay. Uh, instead, uh, suppose if we are not uh, only taking the particle size, we are also taking uh, what is contained within that particle, whether it's, uh, suppose it's an ice particle. If Even if we are not considering the size, so ice will have a crystal shape. So it will affect the scattering rather than a homogeneous water droplet kind of a, a thing. So your phase function uh, that will uh, influence your uh, scattering, the medium will influence the scattering, the shape of the particle will also influence the scattering apart from the size. Okay, so there is, uh, it's not exactly a question, but anyway, anyone can answer. There is a question, are there any okay. websites where I can read some studies about how satellite weather forecasting helps agriculture. There are actually uh, different papers are there. Agromet papers would be there. Uh, they, they would be available from a Google Scholar if we can see. So a lot of our scientists are working in Agromet and uh, there is, I think, uh, Dr. Prashant is there. Uh, you, if you can Google Scholar uh, him. So he has some papers into the modeling aspect of uh, how your weather is uh, affecting uh, your agriculture. So there, yeah. there have been papers, lot of papers are there. In any case, any type of website that contains the weather forecasting related uh, aspects derived from satellites uh, are applicable to agriculture as well. Yes, so. yes, absolutely. So anyway, so there is one more question uh, from an anonymous attendee. So do the energy emitted by clouds mm -hmm. in certain wavelength gets changed because of atmospheric conditions? If that is so, how do we get realistic image when it is, when it is uh, dependent on overlying conditions? Okay. Uh, see, atmospheric conditions, obviously, they are not uh, static so these these are changing these are changing your humidity will change temperature will change obviously the cloud formation is a part of those changes will basically uh, they will manifest in cloud formation and with that suppose uh, some aerosol kind of thing is also ingested into the atmosphere they they also will be um, seen as a manifestation in uh, the uh, cloud structure so how exactly will be able to find out that this kind of a change took place. There are ways. So uh, uh, till now, we were doing only the cloud uh, remote sensing. Suppose uh, we, we take uh, different other sensors or other spectral bands. I did not touch upon the water vapor channel. So water vapor channel will generally give uh, uh, humidity or your 
water vapor um, content of the atmosphere so uh, so that ways there there are ways to uh, basically figure out and uh, we also can do a temporal analysis of the thing that uh, we have a background cloud and which is uh, dynamically if it is changing uh, when all the other aspects are same then also we can figure out what is the forcing factor of the change okay now mili ma'am you can uh, continue yeah. yeah yeah one question uh, it is from uh, youtube and uh, dr kelkar has asked uh, what happens when there is no visible means uh, he has uh, commented that your rgb interpretation of clouds was interesting what happens when there is no visible so if there is no visible so uh, we will get uh, if uh, then we suppose that there will be sphere uh, or, or if there is no visible then uh, sphere also gives uh, almost the same scattering effects of the visible but we won't be able to demarcate between a water and a ice cloud we won't be able to find that whether in a uh, visible that uh, ice cloud was um, very bright or not so uh, that kind of demarcation we won't be able to make otherwise as we saw in the spectrum that uh, more or less the scattering effect is also there with the absorption so we won't be able to decouple the scattering and the absorption effect okay uh, one question is uh, from zoom uh, g80 his name i think uh, he has mentioned like that what forces can influence scattering rather than particle sizes uh, we already think, took uh, that question yeah. yeah. okay. uh, so i so, think uh, there are more questions uh, yeah assimilate how can we foresee hell through satellite imagery mm. okay how can it, okay so uh, we already did some uh, directly through a satellite imagery there has to be ancillary other informations as well so we can do synergistic study with uh, our doppler weather radar along with the satellite images because hail particles become very big so uh, initially in uh, in doppler weather radar is a very big particle size as a target so they will be uh, much visible in the reflectivity of the doppler weather radar mm -hmm. with uh, yes, only using the satellite uh, we did some machine learning uh, methods so we try to train our different channels with the target hail history so that way some accuracy we could obtain but uh, at present um, it would be very um, i mean early on to say that we can exactly uh, pinpoint the hail but with hyperspectral measurements definitely there is a big chance to do that okay so there is one more question can we assimilate this satellite data in nwp model because most of the data we got from noaa portal is there any web portal available from isro yes of course uh, we are uh, routinely assimilating all the satellite uh, products into our nwp model that is wrf model and uh, the model outputs are available routinely on our mosdac web portal that is www.mosdac.gov.in and uh, there we are disseminating also and uh, um, in, in that particular uh, web portal we have uh, it is um all the products satellite products are also available and uh, the wrf outputs through assimilation also are available a user needs to have a registration it is available in a public domain and uh, it's a free registration only and after that uh, you can uh, get the outputs of the wrf uh, models as well as the satellite uh, products which went into the model okay so one more question is related to mjo so he is asking about what parameters does one need to look into a track uh, look into track mjo cycle tpw temperature brightness etc okay uh, tpw uh, actually uh, track can be more into um, if we do a temporal um, Uh, um image sequence if we can build a spatio temporal image sequence then we can tackle this problem any particular snapshot at a particular time won't be able to do it but we need to have a spatio temporal image sequence of different parameters then we only can track it 
when track comes into picture we have to include the temporal as well as the spatio uh, domain okay so there are more questions in some reduced data sets we get radiance data by using inverse planck function mm -hmm. we get brightness temperature but the formula is same or it changes on the basis of satellite and instruments see uh, it is just not only the uh, inverse of the planck's function it is just uh, you are getting the radiance which you are taking from the top of the atmosphere so that radiance you are inverting for the um, for deriving the uh, brightness temperature but of course when your radiance is moving from the atmosphere it is basically getting absorbed some radiation is getting scattered into it so all those things are also possible so that exact uh, your um, inversion won't give you the physical temperature but that is why it is called the brightness temperature so inversion of the planck's law because uh, suppose your land surface temperature is there or your cloud top temperature is there when it is reaching your satellite it is also undergoing a lot of other processes like it is getting absorbed or scattering all those mechanisms the, the trace gases are also present so they those are also absorbing in different bands your aerosols are present those are uh, scattering so that is it. okay there are three more questions to go is it possible to have a peak a peep into cloud burst i mean i think he meant probably can we identify cloud burst through yes actually we uh, developed one method so we we cannot say that it predicts cloud burst there is nothing like that but having uh, a sequence of satellite images or having a set of satellite uh, data we have uh, certain signatures of cloud burst before it occurs or we can say a cloud burst potential so that of course has to be combined with lot of other meteorological synoptic data in order to get a, a accurate um, uh, prediction or if if at all it is possible but uh, satellites we have seen we have actually used the insert 3d data we have used the cloud sat data in order to see that there are certain signatures before the formation of a cloud burst and when that gets coupled with the vulnerability zone that some regions are very uh, vulnerable to cloud burst so if we can we are actually identifying those regions and there if this kind of a configuration of clouds is taking place or the cloud top cooling rate actually we are seeing so uh, that kind of configuration is taking place then we have a potential for cloud burst so this kind of potential alerts we are giving on our portal which is the mosdag.gov.in we are regularly being uh, uh, providing this information over uttarakhand and himachal pradesh so the user can please check that uh, portal so next one is uh, what are the general corrections made when you get raw data from clouds at sat at satellite at satellites to make it a realistic image uh, that's a very good question so there is an entire suit of uh, pre processing or uh, data corrections which is required before giving it as a product so raw data is uh, received then calibration is being done then uh, geolocation corrections are getting done the projection we are not getting uh, the data as it is as we are seeing now so uh, that in order to map that on a particular on our geoid so those kind of geolocation uh, corrections are uh, being done in order to put it from a cartesian to a um, your lat long uh, projection so those projections um, are getting done also with that there are cert certain errors such as servo error so all those errors are getting uh, uh, taking care of so uh, we have our data product team so entire team is working on the level one processing which which gives you the radius so uh, before the radius we are getting something called the dn value the digital numbers which basically gives the signal in digital numbers so from the digital numbers to a calibrated radius and from the uh, calibrated radius to a brightness temperature the entire thing is being done our by our data product team and there is an entire software uh, intensive software for all those corrections step by step corrections are getting done every every time uh, so last question from my side uh, from the zoom 
what are the limitations of tpw imageries uh one main limitation of the tpw imageries or for that matter all the optical imageries that they are coming from the uh, top of the atmosphere or from the cloud top so if one thing if uh, there are uh, clouds um, in, uh, of, of course you are getting only the tpw over the cloud and if if the, it is a cloud free uh, region then only you are getting the total uh, precipitable water content so uh, this is one <coughs> major limitation of using the optical data and basically for using the tpw thank you dr jagbandhu so is there any question from youtube yeah one question is there and it is by dr b nagraj uh, it is uh, related to how to detect convective clouds using multi satellite observations over south asia and uh, quantification the variability of change in climate how to do that okay uh, first first question is how to pick out a convective cloud yeah. so uh, uh, for, uh, first thing is uh, the thermal infrared uh, band it provides a very good information about the cloud top height but as we know uh, a cloud um, it, it may pick a cirrus cloud as well because it will be a very uh, having a very low temperature at a greater height but it won't be convective so in order to pick a particular convective cloud we need to look at the cloud top cooling rate or uh, the rate with which a cloud has moved in the vertical direction so for that we need to take the temporal differencing of the different uh, um, of, our, of our acquisitions obtained in the thermal infrared region and when we track those uh, cloud top cooling rates do we observe whether uh, the uh, system is convective or not and uh, second one was a quantification yes. of variability of change in climate whether variability is... of change in climate is for that we need uh, our uh, climate variables for a longer time it has to be stored so inset using inset series of satellite or for that matter the other satellites as well uh, climate change aspects uh, will be uh, possibly be governed by having a long climatological data so if we are taking a background climatological data and trying to see the perturbations in a way we can do otherwise uh, see surface temperature we can see the because that is a very stable parameter so if we can see the sea surface temperature then we can measure the change in climate uh, which was uh, which is basically getting manifested into the temperatures of the sea so one way to do that is that and other uh, other way is also to see the different extreme events what is the frequency of the extreme events which are occurring so uh, that also uh, is one change in climate uh, ma'am another question is from same uh, person uh, he is asking is it possible to predict the thunderstorm clouds using computational analysis like ai ml yes yes there is absolutely lot of uh, i mean a strong potential is being shown and there is lot of studies so we are also doing a lot of studies in the domain of identification of uh, thunderstorm using satellite images and deep learning methods have shown like convolutional neural net for that matter in order to classify and when we can club them with lstm model or uh, conv lstm model we we can have a very good chance of trying to predict exact thunderstorm with it thank you uh, thanks uh, dr jagbandhu but uh, dr minimum for this nice uh, question answer session so now let's uh, take this uh, photo let's do that photo session uh, tagi sir can you switch on your camera uh, tagi sir can you switch on your camera yeah so the way you also take i am also taking yeah, or uh, disturb people also yeah So if it is done, just yeah, it is done, sir. Okay, from my side it is not done. Okay, so at least one picture is there, so uh, that will okay. So now uh, this is the time for photo thanks.
so let's i invite dr ranjit kumar uh, to do that vote uh, unmute and also if you wish to share the screen Visible. Yeah, screen is visible, not, but if it is in a presentation mode, in full view mode, it would be great. That is okay. Yeah, perfectly fine. So, first, uh, I would like to convey blessed evening to all of you. In fact, this is my proud privilege to propose a vote of thanks on the occasion of fifth lecture of satellite weekly online lecture series on the remote sensing of clouds using multi-sensor observation by Dr. Bipasa Paul Sukla, a Space Application Center, Ahmedabad. It was really an awesome talk. I would like to congratulate Dr. Bipasa Paul Sukla for wonderful delivery of such an informative lecture. Dr. Bipasa Paul Sukla currently works at the Space Application Center, Ahmedabad. She has done her PhD in applied mathematics. Their current project is satellite based weather now casting and cloud microphysics. She is a well renowned expert and has gained a skill in the field of radiative forcing, metallurgy, climate change, remote sensing, now casting of major scale system, satellite data, climatology, and precipitation. Dr. Bipasa Balsukla, I just uh, like to uh, convey that I am also involved in the aerosol radiative forcing calculation over in the RP network project. I am a principal investigator for the Agra Observatory, which was uh, you know, coordinated by space, uh, the SPL, the Space Physics Laboratory, Trivendra. Uh, okay, sir. Good to know, sir. Dr. Bipa, uh, we gratefully acknowledge Dr. Bipasa Paul Sharma for sparing time and sharing her knowledge. I'm sure participants would have been benefited for, from her wisdom and knowledge. We would like to thank Dr. Swagat. Paira, BIT Mesra, and Treasurer Sama for moderating the session in very professional manner. In fact, he and Dr. Divya Prakash are instrumental in organizing this lecture series. Dr. Mili Ghosh Ni Lala, BIT Mesra, and Dr. Jagdambu Panda, NIT Raur Kela, are gratefully acknowledged for taking question and answer session, which was most important to take it and handle it. Finally, we express our heartfelt thanks to all the participants and attendees who joined us from across the globe. Your presence added immense value to this occasion and made this program successful. In the last but not the least, I would like to express sincere gratitude to Professor Ajit Tyagi, President Sama, Professor Sama Samaiswar Das, Secretary Sama and Professor Mohan Kumar Das from Bangladesh for their kind guidance and consent to organize this satellite weekly lecture series for the benefit of interested participants and community in large. We wish for a splendid day ahead and more enthusiastic lecture in future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Ranjit Kumar. I mean, I would also like to add uh, that Ms. Chatuska Premachandra, uh, so for in the vote of thanks, somehow uh, she is missed in this uh, list. Uh, thank you, thank you for uh, the whole lecture. So, if there is any uh, discussion uh, from Professor Shweshad Das, Dr. Ajit Tagi, uh, thank you. So, otherwise, we can conclude the session right now because uh, the first session most probably we are going through the time. So it's one of yeah, it's one of the great achievements, I could say.
it was uh, really a very very good. Oh, sir can i uh, stop the streaming yeah uh, yeah yeah yeah